from Dialects of the Elori, a play for mothers and cubs. Once, a very long time ago, a child sat staring up into the night sky. Mother, the child asked, what are those lines there that run between the stars? No one knows, replied her mother. The strangers tell us they are the bones of some ancient beast whose body spanned the entire universe. Is that true? asked the child. Of course not, said her mother. The strangers have no claws and no spots and cannot even hunt for themselves. Then, generations later, a child sat staring up into the night sky. Mother, the child asked, what are those lines there that run between the stars? The Mahoy tell us, those are the roads that link us to other worlds, said her mother. That is how the Mahoy came to us when we were all children, as you are now. Why did they come to us? asked the child. Because we are strong, said her mother, and because we were not yet wise. Now a child sits staring up into the night sky. Mother, the child asks, what are those lines there that run between the stars? They are called the old bones, replies her mother. They connect our star, Thea, to other stars throughout the galaxy and allow our ships to travel between them. Will I ever get to travel to another world? Asks the child. Of course, says her mother. One day, when you've grown big and fierce, you and your prowl will board a ship and travel from world to world, writing the words of the Mechoi with the edge of your blade. So, are we ready to start? Should I read the thing? I'm reading the thing. Read the thing! Dang it! All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Chimera. This is a role-playing adventure show where a group of college friends and longtime campaign collaborators get back in the saddle. Right now, our campaign is The Old Bones, where our cast is a multi-species group of misfits crewing a mysterious starship in a near-future superhero space opera. We're playing with a pre-release version of the Story Path system that will be powering Onyx Path's Trinity Continuum games, which we've bent and folded to cover the gaps. Uh, I'm Vin LeBate, I'm playing Sidra, a living financial instrument, and joining me this week are... Braden Lamb, playing Dang, a uh, light-eating space monster. <laughs> um, this is Jeffrey Bard, I'm playing Raleth, a uh, galactic lawyer. Uh, I'm Casey Smith, I'm playing Molly Harrow, who's a human technophile and the captain of the Chimera, our ship. I'm Kelly Weissman Aspruth Jackson, portraying Theron Melanthios, a intimidatingly large cat person, heretic. Yeah, that covers it. <laughs> and I'm Josh Hallbachner. I'm the GM of the current campaign. So, when last we left our intrepid band, I believe that we had uh, just escaped from a uh, galactic bar by the name of the Sixth Eyeball with um, a powerful and mysterious artifact known as the... Now I have to find my own... The, uh, the Uda, Uda Tuan. Uda Tuan, thank you. Um, back back to the ship. And uh, we, had, we had also just established that the, um, the galactic map, which appears on the wall of one of the... Uh, of the, the navigation chamber of, of the Chimera had actually just updated itself to uh, reveal what looked to be a new galactic pathway that was not previously known. So that's kind of where we left off, and we, we had agreed that we were going to try to kind of follow up on that plot hook as our, our next adventure. So mm -hmm. um, let's get right to it. Well, do we want to do the XP stuff first this time? Oh, yeah, we should do that, shouldn't we? Yeah. Let's do that. There's also the matter of the XP from last time, which I'm not bringing up because we have to do it now, but just as a reminder that I think you said you wanted to do something with that. Yeah, I think I'm just going to, rather than try to backfit it, I'll, I think I'm just going to give everybody the max for last time, and uh, we'll, we'll try to follow the system-ish this time correctly. Nice. Fair enough. I think that's easier for everybody. 
Okay. So I think the way we were going to try and do experience is a, a little different than uh, typical game setups, but we're going to set some goals for our characters and for our team. And then depending on how many goals we're actually able to achieve at the end of the story arc, that will determine how much XP each person gets. So I think the first thing we might want to do is look at the group goals and then go to individual. Mm -hmm. So, okay. pull. so the, the biggest one, and this we probably should have picked before, but now that we have a session under our belt, we can, um, we can maybe kind of pick this a little bit more effectively. But the first one is to, to be a campaign specific goal that we kind of keep coming back to every session. Mm -hmm. So um, for, for this, it's, it's probably best if, if you guys can agree on something, I can certainly provide one if you want me to, but um, I was wondering if people had kind of a concept of what they think would be the best way to, to do this. Sure. The example is a little bit, vague so i'm i'm not totally confident i understand the scope we want for this it's sort of so the example you give here is the party takes a problem and solves it while creating another problem it sounds kind of tonal right mm -hmm. the idea is that you're constantly hopping from problem to problem it's sort of a right. out of the frying pan into the fire kind of feel mm -hmm. um is that so we're trying to sort of establish something about tone then really with this mm -hmm. goal, right yeah. yeah, I think we're trying to pick something broad enough that it can apply to the entire campaign, mm -hmm. but specific enough that you actually have to be mindful of it to do yeah, it. I definitely, I th definitely think tonal is the way to go on this one. Something that that kind of fits with what we're trying to make the campaign ah. feel like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, a little something good, a little something bad, or how does the line go? <laughs> something blue. <laughs> The facts of life. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything from the first outing that people thought I would like to see more of this in particular? Anything about the dynamic or the way that the, the story unfolded that we wanted more of? Or I guess anything we, we decided we really didn't want more of that would be the basis for trying to set a kind of a shift in tone. Or anything we were lacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I I always find it entertaining when uh, when we can end off a session with the the group achieving their goal while leaving some sort of like disaster or chaos in their wake. But I don't know how much you guys want to commit to that. I, I don't I don't know if the goal should be disaster and chaos yeah. in our wake. Yeah, we might get that one for free. Right. <laughs> I think for me, one of the things that I'm, I'm finding most interesting about the game and the, one of the things that I'm most excited to explore is the way that everyone's individual background is going to sort of tie into this now group story. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how to turn that into a goal per se. A lot of that has to do with choices made by the GM. Mm -hmm. Although we did also mm -hmm. talk uh, when we were setting things up about the sort of emergent theme we had of uh, people having conflicting aspects of their identities. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it might be, it might make sense to try and work that in somehow. Uh, what about like, as a group, finding our place in the galaxy? I like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think that's a I great goal. That, yeah. How is there a way we can phrase it that at least leaves the door open for incremental progress? Right. I mean, that, yeah. that's something, something I could definitely measure at the end of the campaign, but I think I would mm -hmm. have trouble saying week to week, did we accomplish this goal, right? Did we find our place in the galaxy this week? Well, right. how about um, exploring our place in the galaxy? I feel like you could do that every week. Yeah. If, if we want to make it concrete, I would I would use a verb like, like I think I would say is, is learned or did something that, um, and then this is the part that's hard to phrase, but like spoke mm -hmm. to your place in the galaxy. Um, reflected, you know, uh, determined, discovered. I think things like determined and discovered, it's sort of like you do it and then you move on, and we need a word that means mm. continuing or ongoing. But I, I you know, I, I, I think I think the idea that either you could have something where, um, either something where you know you discovered a piece of information that speaks to this theme in some way, or you had an achievement that. Um, moves you in the direction moves you towards uh more effectively achieving this goal i'm not sure about the exact phrasing of that although i feel like it's probably a standard we can we can work to and maybe phrase more clearly later on yeah something well, we can refine 
so I think ex- explore and reveal um, mm-hmm. both seem like potential words there for me. But I think Jeff maybe asked, is this, do we achieve this goal only when we accomplish it as a party? Or does, does you know, making significant progress on one of our characters count towards it? If it's... Because <sighs> I'm just trying to think of it in terms of our last sessions, right? Mm-hmm. Where I don't think I could say that about our group based on what we did, right? Like, we got in a lot of trouble, we fought some stuff, and we got a device. But we don't know what the device does. We don't know how it relates to, you know, the Chimera in general. Like, Mm. it opens up things, but it's not really, like, I don't know. Is it on that path? Yeah. We we did discover a little bit about Sidra's chain of ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. Roloth had an encounter with people that he's um, met on the field of legal battle before. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but none of that's really group. What if we focused on the Chimera itself? I like mm-hmm. that idea, right? Oh, yeah. like advancing mm-hmm. the Chimera or like our understanding of the Chimera or, you know, some, relating to the Chimera in some way or another. Um, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's still something I could definitely... Uh, it's still certainly something I can work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can wrap in the Chimera and its crew. Okay, so here's what I have written down right now and we can let's see how it sounds and see if we want to tweak it um Mm -hmm. the group goal the first group goal would be the team learned or did something that advances our understanding of the chimera or its crew yeah i think it's it's pretty comprehensive does it does it fall within your standard for what one of these things should be josh Uh, yes yeah it does um it it seems like something that should not be difficult for us to achieve while it's still certainly conceivable to fail to achieve it right like it's not it's not a gimme but it's also something that it's not Mm -hmm. It's not a reasonable goal to expect us to try for pretty hard every time. So I feel comfortable with that. Okay. So that's our universal campaign goal. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. And then I think the next one, you assign us, Josh, as like a session goal. Yep. My session goal here is for the, the players to, or for the group to learn something, um, learn something interesting about how much you can trust each other. Mm. 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 No, no oh, I like that one. <laughs> That's both promising mm-hmm. and menacing. Great. Yeah. That, That's I think, is a good standard for us to look at here. <laughs> promising <laughs> and or menacing. <laughs> and then the third group one is uh, for you guys to pay for this session. Mm-hmm. All right. And that's for this yep. session specifically. Um, and we've established our intent, at least, to follow the trail of this new stellar pathway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That seems like a good one. Oh, we, that's our goal. Our goal is to follow the trail of the still. Oh, I don't know. I, that's what I thought you were saying. But no, I mean, no, I'm, just, I'm just reminding us of what we said we were going to try and do in this episode. But that was a very, it was very out of, out of character intent. This is still out of character, so that's not not bad. Mm. Again, Josh, is that is that the level of gradation you're interested in here? Is it is it something that that's plot that's as plot grounded as that what you're going for, or do you want something more sort of? Um, Amorphous, like your example here, is the party should get to sneak their way into somewhere they don't belong via subterfuge, which is less about addressing a plot element and more about how you would address it. I, I basically figure that there's there's kind of two different things that you can signal with this, right? One is, you mm-hmm. know, to kind of say, yeah, oh, we're we're committed to taking this story angle and seeing where it goes, and in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that kind of gives me the signal of like, oh, okay, this is the actual story direction we want to take. This is what we want to focus on doing. So it gives me the, you know, the kind of reason to be like, okay, yeah, we're really going to try to make sure we can, you know, take the story in this direction. And then the other thing is, the other one is more like the example that's written there where it's like, you know, this is a type of thing. This is like a type of scene or a type of interaction or a, a type of like group dynamic that like, we'd like to see have a chance to play out. And that signals to me like, oh, see if I can find a way to sneak that in. So I'm, I'm kind of good with either one because it's giving me different information. And um, I don't think this this one needs to be really, uh, really challenging to achieve. Like, I think this one is, is, is a good one to have as kind of a reminder of, oh, this is what we're trying to get done. This is what we want to see happen. So I'm, I'm really fine with it. I think either of those works. So is there anything that anyone would sort of be interested in seeing the group do or a a way for them to approach a problem. I'm interested in exploring how the crew relates to each other in re- the course of regular life aboard the ship. Mm. I like that one. Yeah, yeah that seems like a good goal. 
because I don't even know. Yeah, <laughs> that, was a, yeah. that was a good time to find out. Um, and so, what did we agree we were doing uh, in place of the original overcomplicated version of the um, individual rewards? We're going to do them for each other, mm-hmm. and then we're going to yeah. each have individual ones for ourselves as well. And then we'll have the paradigm that's sort of pre-established, which I guess sort of ends up being kind of like a campaign goal for each person, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that was the one that was really just straight, straight up ripped from the uh, the Dungeon World Alignment system, pretty much. Yeah. Um, okay, who wants to start on this then? I don't know. I have goals for I have goals written down for everyone else, but I don't I don't know <laughs> about one for myself yet. What if we? Uh, I really like. I'm really enjoying this new initiative system. What if we just roll for it and, and do the same thing as initiative? Perfect. Order? Do it. Sure. Oh, yeah. Good idea. Yeah. What was my initiative? Six. I think so. Well, damn. I'm going. Well, not first. It was finesse. Plus uh, agility? I think it was, was finesse right? plus your highest combat skill. Hmm. Okay. Oh, in which case I get one more. Hey, that went from zero to two. <laughs> nice. Oh, wait, isn't zero ten? No, no, zero. No, zero total success. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I've rolled a ten. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I've, oh, oh. I've, I've got three successes then. I was rolling one die and I was going to add to that, but that's not the way things work here. Three. Anyone beat three? I have five. All right. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> I provide to the next player my choosing, and then they'll they'll take the choose. So. Um, <clears throat> Vin, I would like to see Sidra. I would like to see some opportunity for Sidra to show us what something that she cares about, an object, a person, something that she's she's emotionally invested in. I'm interested in finding out what are what are what sort of things is someone like Sidra emotionally invested in. Interesting. Cool. Um, do you want to also do your your self goal now? Oh, sure. I guess I might as well since that'll get it taken care of. Um, I my goal is to have some kind of interaction um some kind of interaction uh with Emporos that is noticeable by at least one other member of the crew. Hmm. Uh, and then, so I guess I should come up with mine first. Um, let's see. Hmm, these are hard. Hmm. <clears throat> we should do this in advance next time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. Um, no, nothing like having trouble awkwardly doing it live to remind us to do it in advance next time. That's right. Yeah. That's how we learn. <laughs> Through yep. shame. Mm-hmm. It's a powerful tool. Um, oh, and like a lot of the things I'm thinking of are things we already just covered in the session goal. Um, What's just something you think would be fun to see Sidra do? Like, just for yourself. I think maybe to to explore more about how she got where she is now. Cool. Uh, and let's see, now I get to pick for someone. Um, I'm going to pick for Raleth. All right, so I'm going to say that it would be good to see Raleth solve a problem using the law. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> and now it's your turn. 
All right, so let's do let's do Molly and Molly. I want to see her build something new. Okay. And then for me, I want to try to convince the crew that XS is our enemy number one. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm up. Um, so I have one for Theron. Can I pick Theron even though he already went? So then, But then I guess it would still bring um, them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so Theron, I'd like to see Theron confronted with a tenant of Aileroy life that demonstrates that he's no longer who he once was. Okay, so confront some sort of Aileroy social moor standard um, that he has to acknowledge. He doesn't, he's not going to follow that or he doesn't agree with that anymore and, and, and so show that he's different from the way he was before. Is that yeah, basically. It ended that yeah, that the choice that he makes now wouldn't have been the choice that he made before sort of, you know, the story started, I guess. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. And then oh, so let me fix that. And then I've got to figure out one for me, which is harder. Um I kind of want to see Molly get to do something scientific or experimental with one of the crew specifically like learning more about one of them through science science okay and then i think dang yeah so i've i've got one for myself but then do i have to assign myself a second one or do, or do <laughs> i pick somebody to yeah Let's pick see. someone to assign to, you a to... goal okay yeah uh well, I'll, I'll tell my own first. Um, I want to uh, exhibit a show of martial ability that is less about efficiency and more about uh, uh, making, and a, making a psychological impact. So something that looks cool but is maybe not as not as direct or uh yeah or, or not dry. as killy yeah. or as uh, so f flashy not yeah. bashy mm -hmm. <laughs> cool um uh who do I want to uh Kelly I like your your suggestion do you want to do you want to pick one for Dang sure um and Dang's committed now to less efficiency. Yeah, I, I think so. I would like to hear Dang reminisce about life in the old empire. Hmm. Okay. Okay, then I think that's everyone, right? Yep. Yes. And that will definitely take less time next time. Yes. But I'm glad we did get to go into it on the air. I think it's sort of interesting to delve into the concept of what we're doing with experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. yeah. I've got all of the goals listed on the episode three channel. So if you need a refresher, I think we're up there. Awesome. All right. Okay. So uh, we've recapped. We've chosen XP goals. So let's uh, dive into it. So we have some stuff on tap to get started with here, and uh, we also have to kind of determine how the group is going to kind of become aware of and, and choose to act on this new information that we have. So uh, does anybody want to take the lead on that? Well, it looks like Molly, uh, Sidra wanted to talk to Molly or, or um, have a scene with Molly early on. So Yeah, that's the thing I was thinking we could do in transit, if we're going to be transiting. Okay. So is our... Uh, if our plan is just to follow the new linkage, we can do it while we're making that journey. Well, don't we have to discover the new linkage about first? The new? Yeah, I think we do. I don't think we know it's mm -hmm. there yet. Yeah. Um, 
Which part of the ship is that in? In the uh, engineering Engine. room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Engine room, not engineering. This isn't Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the other thing I think that we were going to try and do was describe, describe the Chimera a little bit because we keep referencing it, but we haven't actually given a very clear picture of the ship or its inner parts. So if we're heading to the engineer, uh, or the en- engine room, Lord, if we're heading to the engine room, um, I guess maybe we could describe the things that we have to walk through to get there. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Sure, but probably um, it's not all of us as, as one body just randomly walking to the engine room. So no, probably yeah. not. Who's got business in the engine room? Well, Molly always does. There you go. Um, so, so she's heading to the engine room because I think she sort of just goes there every day because it's a place that she likes to be. And she can poke at things and look at things and just sort of zen out in there. Um, so she, the Chimera, and anyone else can jump in here. I don't want to be the only one that describes the ship. But uh, the Chimera as a whole is this ship of indeterminate shape do we actually have a shape for it sort of a i was gonna do some some sketches i was almost thinking like a i I think you guys were describing a three-pronged kind of thing with a main body was that right that was that was one that was one design that was that was being thrown around i was actually thinking of something more uh I don't know. Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll do some some sketches. It, uh, it, it can be, but yeah. If, if anybody else has has another thought as to as to the the shape of it, I think I've been picturing it as vaguely, very vaguely conical, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it's it's sort of pointy at one end and wider at the back, and as having um, either sort of two prongs one above and one below or one below and maybe the the second prong is not so much a prong exactly as it's just the midsection of the ship but i think we specific mm-hmm. i remember at one point we specifically discussed the snake section being something that kind of hangs below the um the main fuselage of the ship like most of the snake is 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 a, kind of in the undercarriage of the ship uh, mm-hmm. which is certainly how I'm continuing to picture it and will until someone tells me otherwise. Yeah, I was picturing it as being sort of long-ish with like a, like a, there's a, with the dome on the back uh, Mm -hmm. section we'll probably get into today. Um, I think I was sort of like uh, oblong. Yeah, in my mind it's always sort of been kind of Moya-ish, which is similar, I think, sort of an oblong ship sort of a streamlined ovally shaped thing um, with protrusions off of it. And then the skin of the chimera is this interesting spiral of three different types of uh, texture or uh, structure. So there's a, an element sort of tied to the snake, which is biologic, is sort of a greenish chitinous shape, uh, arrangement um there's sort of a glowing yellow energy coil and there's a mechanical kind of silvery silvery or blue or what i don't remember what color it was um but these three different components are kind of sitting side by side and just coiling from the nose to the tail of the ship um and that's kind of the outside of it which i think is why the uh those thieves that we encountered on the very first episode thought that we were so well off is uh that we have a ship that's pretty bizarre it's pretty fancy. And tricked out yeah. yeah um and then for each of these different components there's a hub that kind of it's not very clear whether this is where the um this element emanates from um or if it's just where it sort of converges but um, so the energy spiral, which uh, has its hub called the lion, which is sort of near the front, um, it's this space that's just completely uh, made of energy, and it's where you can control pretty much whatever you'd want for the ship. So it's kind of like the um, 
kind of like the deck of the ship almost, I guess, or um, the bridge, the cockpit almost. Yeah, the and bridge. yeah, yeah, the bridge. That's yeah. And so nothing's there until you ask for it to be there, and then it sort of manifests itself in this energy form that you can touch. Um, and I, I believe that Rolith also kind of his like personal quarters are some attachment or piece of the lion because of the way his mech interacts with the ship. Yeah, the energy is what allows me to dock with it. Gotcha. And then the metal part um, meets, there's sort of a hub on the top in the middle that we call the goat, and that's sort of the lounge room for everyone. It's got uh, this big area where uh, three-dimensional holographs can project, and also I think there's like a table that can project itself as a physical three-dimensional object if we're trying to visualize something. Um, uh, Vin, why don't you describe the goat a little more? Because I know that's sort of Sidra's favorite space. Yeah, it's a, it's a dome space. So like there's a clear uh, dome on top of it where you can look out into open space or into whatever you happen to be gazing at. Um, and then this is the, the hub of the metal mechanical aspect of the ship. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, It's also the ship's sort of information center. There are a lot of monitors and consoles and uh, stations where the crew can analyze things and go over the sensor data and all that sort of stuff. Um, It's a large round room. It's got decorations that I think we'll get into when we actually get there. And uh, then the biological component sort of culminates in this area we call the snake, which is on the undercarriage of the ship. Um, And Kelly, do you want to describe uh, that hub a little bit? The snake hates you. (laughs) The snake hates everything, so it's not singling you out. But it clearly, unapologetically hates you. The snake is the, the most actively and exclusively biological area of the ship. It is hot and wet and definitely smells at least a little bit funky at all times it's a space in which um one or two people can can literally jack in in the sense that there's a uh, seat you can sit in that basically a slithering tentacle with fangs will bite you and put you into a a sort of fugue state into which through which you can control the ship's weapon systems um it's cramped. There's not a lot of space there. People who aren't plugged into the weapon systems can be there, but it's actively, it's just not a great place to hang out, is my point. It is not a fun room. Especially if you have fur. <laughs> yes. So that's sort of the general shape of the ship. Um, in average, anytime you're walking through the hallways, you're kind of walking through spirals. So you're walking on energy, and then you're walking on metal, and then you're walking on chitin, and then you're walking on energy, and then you're walking on metal, and then you're walking on chitin. Um, when you're using screens, usually the screens manifest on the energy portion. If you're doing anything that's um, kind of fixy or repair-like, you're probably working on the mechanical portion, um, the biological portion sometimes produces light, sometimes... Uh, produces various other unexpected you know substances things, substances um half of which we know what they are the other half we don't really and are a little leery of touching um and there's just different uh, i think there's like three different levels to the ship and different rooms in there and different people have claimed uh certain spaces as their own personal space um and uh then there's the engineering room, which I think, it, or engine room, good lord, yeah. uh, which I think, <laughs> where is that? Is it sort of like mid, mid level? Yeah, I think it's like lower central area. Okay, yeah, I should have this in front of me, but I don't. So we'll say lower central area for now. And if when we like pull up the thing we actually wrote down about it, it's different. It's different. Um, but the engine room has. Uh, It's sort of a strange space in that we're not entirely sure what the engine is or how it works, but it's there. Um, There's two pillars that go from uh, floor to ceiling, and we know that this ties into traveling uh, 
at hyper speeds, which is called riding the old bones, which I think we'll get into a little bit later. Um, and then there's, we never really entirely figured out what the engine itself looks like, except that it somehow incorporates um, all three elements of the ship and that there's some sense of motion and action to it and possibly fractal patterns um, that are being displayed in some manner. Um, so it's a strange place, uh, but Molly finds it peaceful. Uh, so she's heading in there and um, just sort of doing her usual rounds of checking on various areas in the engine room. She's going to come across the star map uh, and notice that there's this little dot that's a different color and there's a link um, along the old bones that wasn't there before. Um, so she's going to kind of uh, use the comm system of the ship, which I think is just a matter of touching something on the wall or maybe even just touching something on your clothes. Um, and she's just going to say, uh, hey, guys, um, not sure what you're up to, but you might want to come to the engine room and check this out. I've noticed something that's uh, kind of interesting. And and in terms of the display here, like I would really, you know, the the, the metaphor I would kind of point to here is if you know when you you log into a, you know, some kind of web 2.0 site or something, and it wants to highlight that something is new, like you have one new IM or something. So there's just kind of like a little, you know, <laughs> some, something's got like a little green one next to it. So like it definitely is marked <laughs> that this is new, but it's not it's not really trying to blare it out at you. It's just like oh by the way, if you were looking, you know, this is here. <laughs> this wasn't here before. Oops, a new portion of the galaxy is available. <laughs> that little window comes up and it's like, press A to move onward, so. Sidra's yeah. going to head down there after taking a moment to consult the computer and find out where the engine room is, because uh, <laughs> she has not been there before. <laughs> I like the idea <laughs> that if she's walking there, like, a little piece of the... Um, energy space will light up and then like the metal piece will blink and then something will like puff from the it was like sort of a weird pathway for her to follow yeah the ship's the ship's gps system is working right internally uh theron shows up at the request of the captain uh no longer covered in alien blood and in fact uh, his pelt looks very nice and and clean and freshly lit <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dang shows up, uh, wiping a little bit of paint off of his, uh, fingers, or off of his, uh, tendrils. Um, he's just been, uh, delineating his own little personal space on the, uh, on the snake. (laughs) I I don't know if anybody else tends to hang out there, because as we, as, as you said, it hates you. (laughs) But but Dang is is doing his his level best to to carve out his own little space. Like this is mine. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's just finished that. <laughs> um, Raleth opens up a window, a holographic window. Um, his face shows up next to Molly's. It says, "Hey, do you actually physically need me there?" Uh, no, I mean, if you can see the space around, that's fine. I don't, you know, I don't want to freak anyone out or he anything. Moves, he moves the, uh, the holographic window around. Kind of like that. <laughs> I think I've got it. Um, I, I just, I'm writing something right now and I, I'm in a really good train of thought and I don't want to leave. Sure. It. No problem, guy. Uh, so is that everyone, everyone came down? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, so I kind of what I noticed was that if you look up on the star chart over there, uh, there's a new link to the uh, the bones that I've never seen before. And at least what it looks like is that it wasn't there before until just now. Um, so that's not a thing that happens. Yeah. Is, is there anybody here who would either have any particular knowledge of what existing star charts look like or, or be particularly interested in this or is this not really a is there anybody who have a you know kind of extra level of knowledge about this besides like you know the, the kind of baseline yeah i know this is how you get around the galaxy my pick for that is Ralith. yeah i i don't have it as an explicit skill 
but um, I would have a very good idea of how the everything is fits together. Yeah, from a legal basis, certainly. So yeah, so so the the um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess thinking about this, this would be the sort of thing that might come up in these sort of things. So the the knowledge of of the exact dimensions and, and layout of the old bones map is actually it's very widespread. The the map that people have been operating on has been pretty consistent, you know, over recently recorded history, certainly. Um, the, you know, the idea has been that, like, anything down to a certain level, maybe everybody isn't always, you know, familiar with. Like, once you get down to the, like, the real backwater finger worlds, most maps aren't going to bother containing a lot of that information. But if you go look at somebody who has a galactic atlas or, or any kind of really detailed thing, you know, all that stuff is still going to, it's it's still all going to be, you know, pretty well documented. So the way that people t- typically look about this is that it's fixed. You know, it's it's a thing about the way that the galaxy is structured and that people don't expect to change or, or have any kind of weather or, or any other kind of like ongoing, anything that would make it operate differently one day to another. And definitely at this spot, this doesn't look like it's something that is in one of those atlases and, and just is getting highlighted here for whatever reason. Like it looks like it's something that is not typically listed at all. Hmm. Yeah, so Raleth saves the document he's working on, <laughs> um, says, I'll be right there, and then starts taking lion energy tubes down to the uh, engine room. Hmm. About a minute later, he shows up. My understanding had been that the bones are not changeable, and that they're and they're generally visible, right? So, so did one just appear, or is this one that people have somehow missed? What is what is the system that it's coming from? Uh, is the system labeled? <laughs> yeah. Does, does does somebody want to dig into that? Yeah, I'm going to start looking at the actual map, what the systems are around it, what the closest familiar system is. And then try to figure out where the hell it came from. So the the system this link comes off of is um, you know it's, it's not anything that anybody would be familiar with offhand. So it's not anything really super notable. If you dig into it, you'll see that it's it's called the Vacroix system. V a c r o r i x. Um, it's it's uh, a system where there's a number of you know relatively mineral rich you know planetary bodies that that people have done you know kind of mining and resource extraction on in the past but no real significant settlements or anything outside of like kind of transient mining colonies so not a place where there's a lot of people you know hanging out or or regularly traveling to outside of these very specific business purposes well so uh what do you think guys field trip Mm -hmm. if it's brand new we can claim it. Uh, I'll get the paperwork uh, started right now. Does the does the system that it's going to have a name? There are names on the chart, right? Hmm? Are, are there are there names like are the stars labeled on the chart? I guess is the question, right? I think actually by by default, probably no. You but if you like, if you click on it, basically. Oh. In which case, uh, sorry, let me. Find the tab where I had this information open. So, you know, if you if you kind of go over and you poke at it, it doesn't really want to give you a lot of other information, but it does provide a name, which is Awe, which is A O W E I. And looking this up, there's no obvious record that this is a system that anybody's particularly aware of. The name doesn't show up anywhere for you if you kind of look around on it as a system that previously, you know, wasn't connected as far as you can tell to the network there's no real information about it like nothing to indicate that this is you know a place that's been connected this whole time and just oh oops nothing was showing this particular linkage it it does not register for you interesting okay so does this have anything to do with the artifact we have like we brought it on the ship and the ship now has a new target hmm Hmm. that's a weird coincidence like do we even know what the artifact is supposed to do 
Yeah, it's supposed to let uh, the user be able to more easily create hybrids between um, energy and uh, biology. So, uh, is it possible that, like, is is there any way that this this little triangle could have talked to our ship without us knowing about it? I mean, there's an awful lot about this ship we don't know, so I can't rule anything out. To me, it strikes me as somewhat unlikely, but uh, I think we'll probably know more once we get there. And we're going to get there because we're going, right? I, I don't know that I want to go straight away to Awe. <laughs> it's a free planet. Well, it's a planet we've never been to. There might be people living there. It's a free star. If they haven't claimed it, <laughs> it's ours. All I'm saying is, why not ask around the Vakoric system first, see if anybody's heard anything, people going missing, weirdos showing up, you know. (laughs) Well, there'll be a new line in the sky, right? Yeah, it seems like part of it's going to be pretty obvious when we get there. Yeah, so first first we should go to to Vakoric's, and we should see what is going on in terms of what what is happening, what, what what has changed, and then we'll make a decision from there. Okay. That sounds reasonable to me. Cool. Uh, All right. So we, I don't think we ever discussed how long interstellar travel takes. Are we talking like a few hours, a couple of days? Um, it, it could be anywhere, depending on the ship, and how big of a distance you're covering relative to the the old bones network. It could be anywhere up to a couple of days to get somewhere. For purposes of the place that you're heading, you're probably looking at hours just based on where you kind of already are and and how many kind of jumps it is. It's nearby then? It's not that many rides away? It's near-ish by, yeah. Yeah. So is now maybe a good time to describe what the old bones are and kind of how they work? I think that one's on you, Josh. Yep. No, sorry. Yeah. Where am I yeah. Yeah. So, um, essentially, the concept here is that all of the interstellar travel in, in this galaxy is based on this kind of ancient, poorly understood technology uh, that was left behind by somebody, where uh, essentially these, these kind of massive beams of plasma actually connect different stars to one another these giant lines that kind of cut across the sky between different um, different star systems and then uh, ships that actually travel this way are actually built to basically use some sort of technology um, using these rare uh, these rare objects called snake eyes to actually kind of hook themselves into these lines of plasma and then travel it at faster than light speeds between these different systems so there's the spine, which is the biggest line of these, the ones that you can, the most ships can travel on at once and at the highest speeds that connect these kind of central galactic uh, systems down one single pathway. And then all of these other increasingly smaller and, and uh, more specific pathways that branch off to every side of that. So because this is the mechanism that everybody uses, all of the kind of galactic civilization is based on people's locations on this network, and all of the travel is built around where people can effectively get to using this. So any system that isn't part of this network is, is basically uh, practically non-existent for most people's purposes. And so any place turning up off of this network in some way is, um, is certainly of some significance. And uh, one of the sort of unusual things about the Chimera, among the other unusual things about the Chimera, is that um, it's a ship that's able to travel along this network, but it doesn't have access to Snake Eyes, which, as far as we know, it's the only ship that's able to do that. Yeah, nobody, certainly nobody's heard of another one that does this. And it's, so it essentially puts you in the position of being the only people who can travel this without, without having to refuel, in that sense. Mm-hmm. So we are the Prius of the yes. uh, interstellar. <laughs> Space Prius. I think it makes us a Tesla. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Technically yeah. speaking. Or a Nissan Leaf. <laughs> also, uh, mental note, don't don't trust the autopilot. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Unless you want to be a leaf on the wind. Take that, oh, God. Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. 
<laughs> sorry, sorry. Forever too soon. Mm. I know. <laughs> All right, so we've got a few hours of downtime now, presumably. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Molly, can mm-hmm. I borrow you for a little while? Um, sure. What's up? Um, so, uh, Sidra's going to start making her way back to the goat, uh, with Molly. Um. Okay. And, uh, like, you probably noticed that since the incident at the, uh, at the Sixth Eye, she seemed kind of distracted, and not in the way that she normally seems distracted, which is like she's watching television over your shoulder, but... Right. Like she's actually preoccupied with something. Okay. And so uh, we're walking the hall. So when we were at the Sixth Eye, we, the people who were there were looking for me, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't, I hadn't accounted for them. I had, I'm fairly certain that they were representatives of the people who originally, um, stole me from the -hmm. treasury on Ardor. And I didn't think that that was actually a sizable organization. I had assumed, and I guess I shouldn't have, that it was the work of a rogue element in the treasury and that when their plan fell apart that they would cut their losses because one generally does not cross the treasury so being persistent in such a thing is usually a terrible idea but (laughs) there's it seems like there's an organization or entity out there that I backtracked to a, a financial entity called Galactic Collections LLC and that is a thing that I haven't been able to crack yet and I am wondering if uh, you could help me see if there's anything we can learn about it Um, so you want to go hacking yeah and so I figure about this time we get to the goat which again is a large round metal room with uh, initially, when we got here, it would have been quite stark. Uh, there's sort of a central table that has all sort of technological uh, display options and a bunch of consoles. Uh, but now it's also covered in tons of throw pillows and couches and comfy chairs. And Sidra's room is right off of here, and she sort of treats this as an extension of her room, and it all looks about the same, which is just large piles of cozy things to sit on. So uh, she's probably going to pull up a couple of consoles for them to start delving into things okay yeah um molly will drag one of the big poofy cushions over so she can sort of sit on that while working on the console and um i guess uh uh, she'll let citrus sort of take the lead as far as where we're going to start looking yeah so i'm going to start by sort of backtracking the uh the investigatory route i took when we were at the bar and sort of lay out the various connections that I found there to see if Molly can build off of those. Okay. Um, So I guess in doing that, I'm going to try to follow any, follow any potential leads and also do it uh, in an attempted means of, you know, cyber stealth, I guess. Um, I would rather not get noticed doing this considering everything that Sidra just told me about the potential scariness of the people that we're about to try and snoop on. Um, so I'm thinking for that. Oh, where's my where's my handy dandy sheet? Um, I would say probably technology and reason or cunning. Which do you think would fit better? Probably cunning for this one because we're being kind of sneaky. Um, I also kind of have a couple uh, tricks. One in Enigma. And one in science, they kind of say when you're trying, when you're doing something investigative, those pools also apply. So I don't know if that, Mm -hmm. so that gives her a pretty decent pool to work from. Um, So that would be cunning is three, technology is five, six, seven, 
eight, and then uh, science is five, so that's 13, and then enigmas is two, so that's 15. And so just, just try to state again, like clearly what, what exactly your, your intent to accomplish is here. Um, I'm trying to find any leads that Sidra wasn't able to locate and follow them to see if we can penetrate this. Um, what's the name of the corporation again? Galactic Collections LLC. Yeah. So basically, if we can see what Galactic Collections LLC is a shell of, and um, like if we can get through the shell and trace it closer to its source. Um, without being noticed. Because yeah, I, I hit a wall using financial research, and I'm trying to see if she can get farther using traditional techno research. And could you could you just real quick state what you techno what research. you kind of already established so we can use that as the starting point? Uh, we figured out that they were the employers uh, of the excess that we ran to at the bar, and Essentially, I backtracked that far and hit a real serious wall in the form of this very large shell corporation, it looks like. Mm-hmm. I wasn't able to get any farther than that. Mm-hmm. So I think we're just trying to get farther without being noticed. All right. So let's see. Five successes. Okay, okay. Five? Yeah. Um... And so, so we, like you established, we, we kind of followed out the financial connections here to about the extent that we could. So you're going to be steering kind of aside from that. Mm-hmm. You know, instead, uh, I think probably the, the angle that's going to kind of be the most useful here is, you know, searching almost like public mentions or, you know, trying to find evidence of this place that exists on more of a hearsay level. Uh, things outside of the like pure financial connections and more like have other people run afoul of this, have other people, you know, had to, you know, wound up in a situation like this where something that they were connected to seemed to, you know, to, to go up and disappear into this, this same weird organization. And that's the angle that's going to prove the most fruitful here. Like um, it's, it's obviously not something that you find a lot. Um, it's not, Something where there's, you know, it's it's very really prominent. There's a ton of mentions or something. In fact, typically when you find any evidence of this, it's you're seeing it kind of slipped in almost as a side note to to much bigger issues. And typically, what you're seeing is in cases where there's either you know kind of major legal cases, or you know sometimes like uh, especially disputes about planetary real estate, or. Um, hmm or differences in personnel law even across different portions of the galaxy. There's a lot of cases where if you start going through a list of people bankrolling some particular group, these guys wind up maybe four down the list. Or where there's a set of different plaintiffs that show up in some big, uh, what do you call it, when you a lot of different people are all suing together, uh, class action. You know, these guys might yeah. wind up somewhere on that, that list of defendants. Um, or even just investigative pieces about who owns some like some moon where something weird has been getting developed and nobody's really quite sure what's going on or, or who's responsible for it. And what you can establish pretty quickly is that the dimensions of this actually seem to go back quite a bit and they seem to fade in and out. So you'll see a few different things that have happened lately, um, you know, and, and we can take this and, and kind of uh, I'll, I'll provide kind of a more detailed list to pour over later after the episode. But, you know, there's maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, three or four cases in recent memory, you know, something while while within your human lifespan, basically, that would have uh, shown up with this. And then kind of a a lull period. And then maybe like 150 years ago, there's a period where there's a a variety of mentions of this, like five or six. And then a lull period and, and kind of back and forth. But you can see mentions of this stretching back, you know, multiple hundreds of years. So on a, on a galactic level, this is some organization that's been getting brought up and, and kind of put back in the portfolio for a while, presumably by somebody or some group of somebodies who, you know, are, are playing some kind of really long game in terms of kind of manipulating various things on a galactic level, if that makes sense. It's a financial winter soldier. Yes. Yes. Ha! Ah! Oh, snap. Oh, I still need to watch that. Um, 
Anyway, so well, so from what I can see of these guys, they're um, they keep things pretty quiet. They find little pockets and places where nobody looks and put themselves there for what looks like financial gain or benefit. You know, um, suits that come up that uh, have multiple uh, plaintiffs in it. Maybe they'll be there or um, unknown or sort of half-noticed projects that show up on a moon nobody cares about. Maybe it's these guys. Uh, and equally interesting and potentially even more concerning is that they've been around for a really long time. I mean, um, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years, but not consistently. They kind of appear uh, are around for a connection of years, go away, uh, show up, you know, a century and a half later, are active for a little while, go away. Um, I wasn't able to get much more than that. So uh, all I really got for you right now is is they're they're big, they're quiet, and they're old. And I don't know what they want. Hmm. That's troubling. <laughs> hmm. She sort of sits back into the cushy velvet chair that she's sitting on well the other thing is i mean they never had to deal with us before either so they might be in for a few surprises of their own if they try to make trouble Hmm. i have an out of character question because yeah. i'm both not there and not someone who has any my character does not have things to contribute to this conversation <laughs> uh but what something that occurs to me is you said they go back hundreds of years right mm-hmm. do they go back far enough that we could leave it an open question as to whether they might go back farther than the current legal, the current intergalactic legal regime. They specifically do. Or intergalactic. Yes. They specifically mm-hmm. do. So that, that we're not tracing them back to their origin necessarily then. We're just tracing them back as far as the, re- the easy record. Yeah, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll say, because this is, I'm sure, going to be one of the follow-up questions, uh, the current legal regime, you know, there's, there's kind of an unbroken, to some degree, like, uh, galactic system that, that's, that's connected to, which probably... Um, is connected to some degree to uh, the Ardori. No, no, the um, the bird ones, the Nasiri. Is that what I called them? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably connected to some degree to them. That's not to say that that's all the law that's ever existed in the galaxy. And certainly, if super old historical legal investigation is something that we want to do, that's certainly an avenue that exists. It's just a question of like then you're really kind of doing legal archaeology on top of just going back to galactic Lexus Nexus, you know? Well, we should talk to Rolith yeah. then. I feel like we know someone who's like it's, 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 it's definitely yeah. an angle that exists like that, that we can take further if that's what we decide to do. Yeah, I'm going to uh, to assemble the our two sort of sets of data into a uh, a dossier and just forward it to Rolith. <laughs> See what you remember about these guys. Um, the other thing is, I guess now, Sidra, you have a new list of projects and lawsuits that they were working on that had a flow of money oh, that's true um, that you may be able to look at as far as examining each of those incidences specifically yeah i i suppose i'm going to try and puzzle out if there's any if there are any links that jump out between those legal events financially well like i like i said i'm going to try to draw together uh, a sample list of this with some more details that we can kind of pour mm. over so we'll we'll say for now that, that you've kind of got that list and you're kind of mulling it over. Um, okay. And then when we come back to that next, we can we can dive into it a little more detail once you've got some concrete info in front of you. Does that sound good? Cool. Mm-hmm. I'd like to intrude cool. in the scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So while you all are having your hacking party in the goat, mm-hmm. uh, and you know most of the way through it, so you've been at it for a little while. Uh, Theron is going to come in. Um, he's Got his kopesh out. He has a satchel slung over his shoulder, and there's one of those venomous um, monkey bats is still still has its fangs stuck in, into his uh, <laughs> bicep, uh, which he sort of notices and brushes off and <laughs> squishes on the floor. Um, he he acknowledges you and says, "Hey, hi, Captain. Hi, Sidra. Don't mind me." Goes over to the table in the middle of the conference room, throws down the satchel, uh, takes out a couple of fruit. Pieces, pieces of, of popular hand fruit from the food jungle. Who he's been on a foraging expedition. And he puts, you know, puts it out in the, like the common bowl on the table so that people can take what they want. And then he also hauls out this uh, this bright orange melon, 
uh, about the size and rough shape of a watermelon, uh, and sort of sits down there. Again, you know, he's just sort of doing his own thing, so you can keep talking around him, but while he's, while he's sitting at the table, he pries open the uh, melon, and there's a lot of, like, creamy, um, creamy purple juice on the inside, and a, a noticeable smell. And mm. he, so he pries open the melon, and the inside of the melon actually has the same kind of consistency and modeling as uh, flesh, um, <laughs> like mammalian flesh. Meat melon. Uh, so he just like sticks his face in it, like just just like goes nuts on the thing, uh, <laughs> as you would expect a cat to go on a, on a meat melon that it just collected. Um, so that's all occurring in the background of your project here. Just that's that's my contribution. Eat the meat melon. <laughs> As, as that's happening, Sidra just reaches over and grabs a piece of fresh fruit um, and starts in on it, pausing only to say, I really wish you'd be more careful with the bats. It's okay. I killed it. <laughs> uh, I feel like now you need to explain the food jungle because that was a brilliant read. <laughs> the food jungle is where most of our food comes from. Also, it is infested with venomous monkey bats. <laughs> it's a sort of deck of the ship that is uh, a small, portable jungle of fruits. Yeah, it's about a football field long. Our, our best guess is that it, at some point it was actually a garden or a farming area of some sort, but it went neglected for a very long time. Uh, plants grew very large and... Uh, so there's a lot of hacking through vines to find anything, but there's always food there to be found. Um, and there does seem to be an infestation of venomous monkey bats that you kind of have to deal with whenever you go in there. But they're they're really good pollinators, so you can't get rid of them. Yeah, so you can't get rid of them. <laughs> um, the and now. like, they're cute when they're young. Like I think Molly's probably like had a couple orphan ones in her room until they got big enough that they started trying to bite you, and then she'd release them. Back. Yeah, Sidra is also a fan of the bats. So uh, the meat melons are in season now. That's good to know. Yeah, do you want some? Nope, nope. Uh, it's just a quarter I'm going to be avoiding. Oh, boy. Okay, then. So that, uh, I, I think with that, we've probably about exhausted the uh, the contents of the, of the trip. So you guys will be coming out of, um, of FTL just shortly into the... Um, I just wrote this down. The, the Vercorix system. So, uh, are you guys going to be uh, watching or anything, like in terms of? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's a big system, right? You can't. There's multiple planets, so we can't just be like, "Hey." Well, the second we come out of FTL, here's my mm -hmm. question, right? The the bones are lines that run off of the star, yep. right? So. Are there, there's a new line here? Is it, does it look weird? Is there anything about that? I mean, as soon as we get off of the line, we're right by the star, right? So that's my first question. What, what's the situation just stellar imagery wise? What does it look like? So, um, so you guys are, are coming out and, you know, while you're, while you're traveling, it's hard to get a good sense of, of any of this kind of stuff because the light of the, the line that you're actually traveling on and the high speed and everything makes it difficult to really get much of a, a picture so when you stop you're going to kind of stop and, and get this clear you know image of what's going on around you all at once so um researching this system beforehand you see that it's basically this um this red giant you know star that that connects into here um and that you know there's there's a large number of different planets that are all pretty widely spread out around this it's a big star and so there's you know something like you know 20 plus different individual planetary bodies that all orbit around it in different kind of weird angles and directions. And, um, you know, there's, there's kind of some galactic signposting that's been done here since most of these, again, are, are only really being used for resource mining. There's a place where you're likely to kind of come off when you disconnect from the bones. There's some, you know, kind of tiny, um, you know, uh, satellites and everything that are basically in place to kind of signal you on and go, okay, yeah, if you, if you want to go to this planet, like we're tracking it, it's kind of over here and everything. 
Um, and digging into it, you find there's kind of a picture of what that should look like at the, at the spot that you would arrive at um, in a normal type situation. There's, I'm going to say there's like seven of these that you would normally see that are, are kind of arrayed in this one particular way. And when you disconnect from the line, what you, it's immediately clear that something is, is not right. Something is different here because one, as you say, a second line of plasma has indeed arisen to come off of this red dwarf going off at a completely different angle. Um, and the particular angle that it cut off at, unfortunately, goes right through a section of space where some of these satellites would be. So instead of seven, like you're expecting, you see five, and then basically a, a bright line of energy cutting through where the other two would have been. So... Mm. Hmm. Uh, it definitely, based on what you can observe here, it definitely seems like something that has has happened pretty recently and uh, without a lot of regard for the infrastructure that was set up in this area beforehand. Oh. But otherwise, there's nothing obviously different about the new line, right? It's just, it's it looks like all the other old bo- pieces of the old bones we've seen yep. before. Hmm. Yep. Uh, typically, these tend to... Um, the, the kind of the flow of the plasma for these tends to come from like emanate from like the spine outwards. So typically you're going to see each line to some degree have a visual quality that is more like the starts coming out from mm. than otherwise. So, mm-hmm. so here you've got kind of a, a, a more yellowish line coming into the star and then a reddish one coming out of it. So it's clear like something happened if you were going to, if you were going to kind of theorize about it, something happened at this star that caused this line to come out of it to go out mm-hmm. to wherever it's going. And so the, the, the kind of plasma material of the stars is kind of what you're seeing represented there. But it looks just like you'd expect one of these to look like normally. Like if, if you would, if you had been told that there was already a line here, this is exactly what you'd expect to see. But that's interesting to know that there's a certain directionality yes. in the lines. Okay. Well, um, if we're here, what's the most populated mining planet? I'm thinking maybe that would be the one to head to yeah, the, to find the, out. The planets don't have separate names here, so it would be uh, Vacrorix 17, basically, is the one that would be the most active at the moment. And you you know that there's there's basically just kind of a small corporate mining facility that's there, but is, is actively kind of digging stuff up there. So you know that there should be some number of ships and, and some number of like alive people there in a normal circumstance. I'd I'd like to quickly, as we enter into the system and establish that this is a new thing, um, see if I can check through uh, all the various docking and transit and ship records to see if anyone has gone down there yet. Okay, give me a roll. Uh, I'm going to guess that's cunning liberal arts or reason liberal arts. So that's nine for me. Okay, there. Yeah, so there are uh, docking records that you could pretty easily publicly access for this station. Um, normally, you'd expect to see something on the order of, um, you know, maybe 12 per quote unquote day, you know, ships coming in and out. Um, but looking this up now, at this point, you don't see any activity in the last 18 hours. Hmm. Were they expecting something weird to happen? You know, this is, I assume this is something at least slightly comparable to the way one approaches an airport, right? So we probably need to like signal ahead, you know, get approval of the land, that kind of thing. If we're going to go dock, is that Typically, accurate? yeah. Okay. Are they responsive? Nope. Okay. Mm. Well, now it's getting creepy. Uh... Want to head down anyway? Yeah. I think we better. Yeah, I think we should. Okay. So, coming out to the planet, it's um, pretty small. We're, we're talking kind of like a, you know, a Mercury-sized planet here, maybe. Um, it's got kind of a, a bluish-turquoise appearance from above, a combination of kind of the uh, thin ice coating that covers most of the surface of the planet, and then some of the 
you know, strange gases that form the atmosphere. It's pretty toxic to, you know, humanoid type life by default. So it's, it's certainly the kind of thing where you typically need to be inside some sort of atmospheric bubble to, uh, to do okay here. And there's kind of one central starport with a variety of kind of docking stations, um, that you, uh, you know, kind of a, a basically like a, a tower that comes up a certain amount out of the ground and has various kind of little, um, you know, kind of uh, metallic, you know, arms that you would kind of come up to, to dock to, and it would, they would each kind of grapple onto you. It's a small planet, so the gravity's not that that big, so you can dock in air like this effectively. Um, and it, it, you know, coming into the atmosphere, you see there are several ships still docked at it, um, but no mm-hmm. obvious activity. Nothing's moving, nobody's taking off or anything. Hmm. Can we... Can we do like a scan to see if there's any like telecommunication going on right now? Like signals being sent? Like do do a little EM scan of the the airwaves around here? Who's our communications officer? There's 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 um there's yeah. typically a few different default signals that you'd see from a place like this, right? So one is just kind of like the it's almost like the the clock. Uh, transmission you know it basically just says yes the system is still alive and this is what time we think it is and you know um like we haven't been blown up and that's still going just fine it's all kind of automated mm. it's just like the time is now um and then you would also expect there to be um a fixed uh you know like a uh, kind of a fixed broadcast that at any given time is telling you which channel basically to call in on so you'd expect that to be kind of regularly updated so you'd know how to you know, initiate a, com- uh, a communication in order to dock or something. That does not seem to be playing. All right, then I'll bring her in to dock wherever it looks open. You know, these mechanisms are all pretty advanced, even at kind of a backwater place like this. So if, you know, uh, unless somebody has locked it down, you can typically, you know, kind of expect to fly in and, and kind of negotiate uh, the actual docking itself without a lot of help from the other side. So... You're able to, if, if you guys are all agreed that you're doing that, um, you uh, you can bring the ship in, uh, you know, dock it. For, for this purpose, um, the Chimera is going to basically align uh, their external docking arm with, with a portion of uh, the biological exterior of the ship. And so it'll kind of grow basically these little claws that kind of clamp on from the ship side and then this kind of nice. like you know, weird orifice door will open up. I love this ship. So, uh, there you go. It's never done this before, has it? I, I, I mean, pick a day. It's never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> That's normal. Uh, okay, can we, is there any means of, like, scanning for life forms, more or less, or just detecting if there's any anything actively alive uh, in the vicinity not generally like in quite that sense like okay. there, there's probably things that can do that but it's not on a kind of a star trek level where everybody can just kind of do that whenever they want so okay but we could scan for like heat signatures yeah i do have well that's one of the things my goggles has is heat mm-hmm. heat detection so i might um sort of look out the portal and just uh, put my goggles on and flick it to that spectrum and just see if i can see any signs of anybody being alive or warm at least so just to check so you're looking out you're looking at the exterior or you're looking through the door that just opened i guess i'm looking through the door that just opened particularly at the ships or any other areas where people might congregate just to because it's that kind of space okay um so uh i'll I'll basically kind of set the scene and then put the the heat signature type stuff into there but so basically this this doorway opens and it it takes you out into this like i said you know this kind of metallic docking arm um so the interior of that typically would be kind of pretty well lit and the lights that um uh, you know the internal like electrical lights that it would typically have are all kind of dim you know not really what you'd expect to be set up like this but otherwise it doesn't there's nothing else obviously amiss about this particular pathway that you guys are going to kind of step into and then there's also kind of big like portholes like viewing windows that you can see out from that so you're able to to look from there see the other 
ships that are docked nearby and everything. So in terms of what you can make out, the the ships, the other ships, uh, in terms of heat signature, you're seeing almost nothing, which suggests both that there probably isn't at least any significant quantity of living beings on any of them, and that the mm-hmm. engines are running cold. So none of these have been parked here really recently or had their main systems running um, recently enough that the heat signatures would show up for that. And how recently is recently? So, like, we know that about 17 hours ago, things stopped docking. If if everything had turned off, then would that be what we were seeing now, or would it, they have had to have been off for longer? Uh, that's probably what you're seeing now. Okay. So that, 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 those two facts line up, as far as you can tell, in terms of like, the time. Okay. Um, in terms of the place itself, the actual building itself is a little bit better shielded than, like, what you would be mm-hmm. seeing there. So it it's hard to tell directly if there's if there's definitely anything you can see that there are more systems on here like unlike the ships uh it's not just completely cold if you like look down towards the base of the tower and everything there's clearly still some systems running and and it's dim in here it's not like there's no power on um Mm -hmm. but there's there's nothing that suggests a large population certainly is here um how long ago did the the system show up on our map that's a good question. Um, you we were, don't know. yeah, you were out. It was, it was like that when she, when she went into luck. So, okay, it probably wasn't. I mean, my guess would be Molly was there like the day before, and it probably wasn't. Yeah, you're, you're, would you're, that be accurate? You're, you're looking at like less than thirty six hours, I guess I would say. Okay. I have an important question for you, Casey. Does mm-hmm. your, um, do your goggles have a setting that allows you to distinguish between? Uh, life on the basis of whether it's Kurt Russell or The Thing. <laughs> no, but I do have free spectrum <laughs> open. <laughs> One of those can be allotted I'm for saying, Kurt Russell. Uh, the Thing spectrum would be really useful. Right. Well, I, okay, so I do... Um, the other spectrum I'd like to look at the space in is Noetic. Nothing particularly out of the ordinary there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to step back from the door and I'm going to say, well... Uh, I can't see anything warm enough to be considered alive. Um, and none of the ships are active. Uh, but they look, I mean, as far as we can tell, right, they, everything looks pretty normal. So at the moment, I'm, I'm a little worried there's, if there's something that got rid of biological life or has killed a bunch of people, I, I'm kind of concerned about us just walking into it. Um, we might want to have some kind of, protection between us and the environment before we go trouncing through to see what's going on do we have anything like a like a drone we can send in first we've got my hand yeah i can go in too and oh yeah and you've got a drone yeah um so that might be a good first first approach possibly rather than us walking out rather do you want to send your drone because then i can have two hands well i'll be in my drone oh oh you want to take one for the team? I mean, that's fine if that's what you um, guys want to do. I, I mean, well, we basically have three. Uh, when Rollins and his mech, right? We basically have three hard targets and two soft targets on the team, and so it's possible we could just send some or all of the hard targets in without the the more squishy people. Um, right. It's it's more plague that I'm kind of. Yeah, I, I think out of yeah. the out of the crew, only Rollins would would be protected against like environmental exposure either in terms of atmosphere or or biological agents i can at least go in and just look around does it does dang's shields not uh, protect against such things oh yeah i mean i think you still have to breathe so yeah mm-hmm. it, it it probably like in a in an emergency circumstance if you were in a place that was clean you had to move through like a place with toxic gas or something on a on a very short term, that'd mm. probably be doable. But you know, unless you have some other mechanism of of you know breathing and keeping oxygenated and everything, it's probably not. Rollis' character concept includes a built-in spacesuit. I think that makes sense for him to go in. Yeah, um, but be prepared to shut the doors if I start running back screaming. <sighs> Okie dokie. But anyways, I'll go ahead and walk down the bridge. Oh, uh, oh, I did actually have for equipment uh, the uh, 
Uh, I have written on my sheet uh, that Quandru gave Dang a silk suit, uh, which which I was kind of envisioning as as a typical spacey jumpsuit thing. Uh, is it reasonable to assume that that could be sealed? Yeah, if you if you have like a suit or or a piece of equipment for that, then that's totally reasonable. Okay. No, I was I was really just thinking like totally by default here. So yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. that's doable if you want to try to do something like that. Okay. All right, dang, you want to go first? Yeah, let's do this. I got you covered. All right. Uh, putting up the force field and uh, taking the lead and kind of just a just a walking pace down the down the gantry way. Okay. Um, you know, and there's there's like an airlock kind of situation that you go through that operates fine so at least on that level whatever kind of mechanical stuff is supposed to be happening on on their side is working so you you go through the uh you know watch is fine there's like a long hallway so that the rest of the the other three of you are all staying behind right and and rolleth and dan are going yeah i'm i think i'm going to try and set up a little monitoring station up in the goat and i was thinking of yeah i was gonna maybe just like rest my hand fondly on rolleth's shoulder and then just let it (laughs) Go with them. Okay. Um, and then anything that it sees can go to the screen that Sidra's setting up. Hmm. Okay. It's it's in hand form, though. It's just like a little metal hand. Yeah, yeah. Scene. Okay. Um, what about the thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're having thing overload here. Too many different things. Yeah, it turns out the thing was us all along. <laughs> <laughs> turns out it's globbering time. <laughs> sorry. You are not sorry. Um. No. <laughs> so, um, you guys go down, that there's like the long pathway, everything all seems totally normal there. Um, at the very end, there's another kind of more heavy duty door that actually leads from the, the walkway into the tower and the, the facility proper. And that one, unlike the first one, does not seem to be responding when you get up to it. So typically there should just be a big, you know, panel that you kind of hit with your hand and it should open up and you do that and it just kind of goes eh, and doesn't do anything mm. i look at the hand it, it holds up one fairly hang on <laughs> uh, and then it's gonna uh you know just sort of skitter down Raleth and become flat enough that it can slide like if there's any creases or any means of getting under the door mm-hmm to see what it can see on the other side. Yeah, for, for the purposes of, of this thing, it can, it can make itself narrow enough to do that. This isn't like a an airlock door quite the same way, so it, it's able to get through. Can it see? Can, like, the hand... Does it have... It, it can send video to me, so basically, like, I can see what it would see. I guess it's not... Okay. And, do you know what I mean? And, and, like, how high quality are we talking? Are we talking, like, potato cam here, or, like... Or, or like you know, GoPro level, like. Um, I mean, it's, it's fucking futuristic nanobots. Okay, so go, go GoPro. GoPro. Level. Okay. Yeah. So, um, the hand squeezes out, and it it kind of reconstitutes itself, and I, I assume it kind of right. you know like puts a finger up to look around or something because. Yeah. Um, so uh, on the other side of this, uh, the the way this is constituted, there's kind of a you know. There's a tower, and there's probably, like, maybe five different kind of mezzanine levels here with both um, metallic stairways and then and then a centralized elevator that goes between these, um, basically to, uh, you know, let people come in from all these different docking ports and get down to the ground level where the proper facility is. And once you're through, uh, the picture of what's going on here is suddenly a lot clearer. Um you look around and you can see there are, you know, big, uh, you know, there's big burn marks and damage to the facility all over the place. Um, there's some stuff that's actually on fire, but also just the clear picture of a fight that's happened with, you know, energy weapons. Um, and there's at least two, at least in the visible area from right where the, the hand is wound up, there's at least two, like, pretty fresh corpses that have clearly mm. been you know are clearly people who were you know uh, working or, or operating here in some sense who clearly were at the wrong end of uh, these energy weapons okay um is the feed that we're getting in the goat can we send that to Raleth's 
uh, mech so he can see it too? I don't see why not. Okay. So I'm sort of just the hands sort of floating around and just trying to get as much of a complete picture as, as we're able. Um, do you guys want to go in and get a closer look? I can see if I can get the door to open from this side. Um, sure. Can you get a sense of what the environment actually is like? It was open flame, so that suggests... Mm-hmm. So there's it, oxygen. Yeah. And are the people that are dead, are they in any kind of protective suit or just... Nope. Hmm. It would have been, you know, kind of regular um, non-exterior outfits. So, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of mining, you know, minor, minor uniforms, basically. You know, people who would have been employed here and um, what you would have kind of expected to see them wearing, you know, in, in downtime, basically. Okay, then if you guys want to go in, I'm going to see if there's any kind of panel uh, on the wall alongside the door that I might be able to either just hit and make the door open or otherwise jerry rig. Yeah, there's some, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, typically it's kind of an old, it's a, it's a computerized electronic open for the door here. Whatever is up with that, that's not functioning, but there's a mechanical, you know, kind of, uh, override force override. Yeah. Where you, you can kind of open up a panel and, and grab and twist a thing and then pull it out and it'll make the door kind of chunk open. Okay, so the little sil- silver hand kind of floats over to that and opens it up, and it sort of hand turns this way, turns that way, almost like a head cocking, and then grabs the the um, winch and sort of pulls it down. Cool, yeah, door. So it's open. You guys can, can step through now if you're looking for it. All right. Hand gives a little thumbs up. <laughs> goes back on Raul's <laughs> shoulder. <laughs> Um, I'll also say, hey, Theron, I think we're clear for you if you want to come on with. I always feel better when I got my Catman with me. I'm on my way. All right. Yeah, when, when, you, when you open up the airlock, you know, the first thing you're going to notice is it, it smells like there's been, some, there's been a bad scene. You know, there's thick, acrid smoke. There's, you know, the smell that you get um, when a lot of people have been killed in one place. Um, you know, based on the smell you're getting, that uh, this probably lines up with the time frame you're looking at for communications going dark. Um, you know, clearly the actual actual like killing that happened here wasn't like super recent, but it was within the last day. Mm. Mm. So Sidra is watching all this in the goat, uh, eating a piece of fruit, and she'll just <laughs> <laughs> glance at Molly and say. This is, this is terrifying, right? I think this is terrifying. A <laughs> little bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so as we progress into this area, I'm going to be looking for people who don't belong, right? We've got the miners here, kind of what we'd expect. I'm looking for people who are not them. Okay. How far afield are any of you willing to go at this point before... Well, you take it next action. Like, are you are you gonna really kind of tentatively look in the nearby area? Or are you just starting to go, you know, kind of level by level, trying to figure out if you can find anything besides? I, dead I miners? think we should check out this level, then call in the rest of the crew, just so that they're yeah. close at hand. If horror movies have taught us anything, it's that we should not split up at this point. <laughs> I, agree. Yes. I have no frame of reference for that. <laughs> I assume it's one of your human things. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll show you one later. So, so looking over this this segment, there's evidence that there was clearly you know some fighting that kind of went door to door here. Um, it seems like it, wh- whoever came in probably came from a, a level above this in and fought their way downwards. You're going to find a total of of seven you know corpses on this particular level. All of them s- appear to be you know, uh, miners or, or staff of, of this um, this facility. Were there any um, ships attached to docks on this level? Just you. Okay. And all the other doors to other arms are closed currently? Mm-hmm. Okay. Sidri, you said that uh, docking stopped about 17 hours ago. What's the ship that arrived last before that happened? Somebody knows the answer to this. 
Josh, I think that one's for you. Mm-hmm. Yep, I'm. I'm sorry. Oh. One, one quick <laughs> okay. second. Yeah, I'm. I'm okay. Yes. He's looking at the manifest. It takes a little bit of time to look at all the yeah. shit. Yeah. It's just. That's what Citra's doing. She's only got one hand because she's eating fruit. <laughs> Yeah, so the the last vessel that you see, and this is an arrival and not uh, a departure, um, and uh, you can pretty quickly identify once looking at this that the the arm that it would have arrived at is currently empty, so that certainly suggests something, is um, a vessel called the Jar, uh, which is J-A-R-R-R-Q, and it's... uh, Operating on, on basically kind of a uh, uh, a self signed registration, if you will, like it doesn't it doesn't represent any, um, at least according to what's listed in the manifest, any major uh, corporation or or you know galactic government, and it's listed as coming here to pick up a shipment of minerals. Presumably, it's the same kind of self registration we operate under, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Can I um? backtrack it's it's financial records and uh, like it's ports of call and such yep give me a roll I don't know why I keep checking my sheet it's always nine everything I do is just one roll mm-hmm. two I got two three sorry three plus um, any possible scale that comes in there okay um so what you're you're able to establish is uh, uh, looking around, digging up a little bit. You know they're operating under a self-signed you know registration like this. So obviously not somebody who's interested in, in having like a super a lot of like reputation attached to what they're doing. Um, but they're also not really putting a lot of effort into hiding from anybody who's looking closely. So you can you can dig it up. Um, it seems to be a uh, a vessel uh, populated primarily by um, people from the Tirasath system, T-I-R-I-S-A-T-H, based on the specific ports of call and the financial records that you're able to identify. It certainly seems like, um, you know, kind of a, a freelance mercenary type operation. Um, and, you know, with, with just a little bit of digging, you can find, and uh, clearly Roth will be super shocked about this, that they have, in fact, operated under contract for the excess. Hmm. Can you send all of that over to me? Yes. Thank you. Having run it full tilt uh, down the corridor in order to meet up with the other two uh, people who are exploring the crime scene, I, uh, Thera now arrives um, and will start using his experience as a crime scene investigator to p- put together, you know, in as much detail as possible how things unfolded here. Okay. Uh, okay. Give me a roll. So we're on the lookout here for XS. If I had a jaw, it would be hanging open. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want, I can work on that when you get back. No, it's okay. <laughs> that, that seems to me like a, like a weak point. <laughs> Seven with a specialty in crime scene investigations. So, um, seven successes on the investigation role. And if it needs to be a, like a long-term multi-part role, I have a skill trick that affects that, but otherwise. Yeah, for, for this, the single role should be fine. Great. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and are you willing to kind of move around a little bit to kind of track down what you're you're looking at here or oh yeah my intention is to move freely about the area so i'm i mean i'm going in with the plan of, of investigating it if that trips something or triggers something then, then okay. I'm, not, I'm not i'm not not paying attention to that but i'm also not like hanging back in an effort to not okay um yeah so uh you know kind of tracing backwards and, and trying to follow through you know you're, you're able to put together a pretty decent picture of what happened here um you know the vessel docked on the second to highest of the levels um, you know, again, uh, listed as coming in for a pickup of minerals. Um, it seems like they basically came in shooting not a lot of interest in, in subterfuge or, or any other type of, um, you know, tricksy approach here. They basically, you know, came in, guns drawn. You know, they, they would have come through, basically opened fire immediately. 
you know, swept up to the, the deck above and then moved downward, basically just trying to clear out anybody present. Um, you know, uh, being a kind of remote mining uh, facility with, you know, some some valuables, but not really any of the sort of things that are you typically be tremendously worried about here. They, you know, were armed, but not tremendously well-armed, and this is a professional mercenary force that had the element of surprise, so... Uh, there didn't seem to really be a lot of effective resistance mounted here. Um, you know, they, so they basically swept through. Um, once they, you know, kind of reached the main facility, they kind of moved room to room, uh, just taking out anybody that they could, um, you know, destroying some equipment, but not with any really, uh, like not any really strong intent to like specifically disable anything here. Mostly just, it seems to you, intended to make this like less useful as a landing point or a, a staging point uh, for somebody who's stopping by with the expectation of like coming here. Um, you know. Like us. Like you. Um, you know, and then at some point, once they kind of cleared it out, uh, they basically kind of gave it a once over, found anything valuable that they could take, including some minerals, actually, but you know, clearly is kind of a secondary factor having already come in um, for a different purpose, packed up what they could, brought it back to the ship, and jetted off. Hmm. And the purpose just seems to be to fuck shit up. Yeah, there's, there's, there, there doesn't seem to be anything that identifies a purpose really specific to this location above and beyond, again, making this facility, like, less useful for anybody else either who was already here because now they're all dead or anybody else coming into the system and expecting to dock here because for the same reason that you guys did it would identify itself as the obvious kind of starting point for somebody coming into the system crash well i'll give the gist of that over the over the comms they were pros they moved through quickly and efficiently the station was poorly defended he says with an air of judgment um (laughs) They don't seem to have had any particular goal here other than perhaps to depopulate the area and to minimize the value of this location in the future. Hmm. Sidra? Yes? Can you get me the owner of this station? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to look up quickly all of the station info, uh, including its complete valuation, all that stuff. Okay. Um, you know, it's uh, in financial terms, uh, there's not a lot here that suggests it's much different from what you would expect, right? Um, as a, you know, as a relatively like high volume but low margin mining facility, it's the sort of place that you would, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of capital sunk into it, but not something that a lot of people would necessarily be interested in owning just because, um, you know, the actual, the margin is not very good, right? It's a lot of expenditure to get minerals that you have to move in large bulk to actually profit off of. Similar to what you'd expect there, you know, this is this is the equivalent of, like, you know, some, like, godforsaken, you know, like, Exxon Mobil, like, oil rig type thing in kind of real world terms here. Um you know, it's and similarly, it's owned by a large, you know, kind of galactic resource conglomerate, um, probably one that's uh, pretty unpopular with many people and, and known to do sketchy things, but only kind of normal corporate sketchy things. Um, I want to draft up something really quick and send it on over to that company, uh, letting them know that XS was involved on a hit on one of their mining platforms and that I'd be happy to represent them <laughs> and I have a portfolio <laughs> of <clears throat> evidence with which to bring to this game. Yeah, uh, I give them a really good rate. Yep. If, if that's if that's your goal, it's definitely not hard for yeah. you to draw together a pretty decent um, list of evidence. I've here. got a bunch of form letters and stuff. You know, like, like for, somebody, for somebody without both the physical investigation and you know, legal and financial investigation that you guys bring to the table, it would not necessarily be straightforward to draw all the connecting lines here, but with all that together, you could, you could definitely kind of paint the picture. Okay. I send that off. Uh, I would like to see if I can draw any lines between 
this station and its ownership and the excess and uh, whoever would have hired them? Yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything. No? Yeah. Are there uh, any cameras or anything that might have uh, been recording when this attack took place? Um, cameras? Uh, I'm going to say anything default built into the facility like that would have been knocked out early on at, mm. the, at the docking point. Mm-hmm. You know, portable EMPs or something like that. And okay. they, they, mm. we, we established they destroyed a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So if they're prioritizing covering their tracks, then that would probably be at yeah. the top of their list. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, so I guess our options might be, one, checking out some of the other smaller colonies and seeing if those were also attacked, or if they're not, um, what those guys know. Um, Or otherwise, uh, riding the bones and going to this um, Aoi place. Um. Actually, I guess the other thing I might want to look at is just sort of sorting through the files on this, like stored in this mining colony to see if that, if Aoi is mentioned at all. Um, Just since this is the closest place we have to it, if there's any kind of, I don't know, anything that was known locally Mm -hmm. about this this place. Okay. Um, I don't think I need a a role for that or anything. There's, There's nothing really particularly hidden here or anything. Um, looking through the records that, that you have access to, uh, there's nothing about Awe uh, in particular. So nothing that seems to reflect any like knowledge about this system existing or the name or anything like that. Um, but there are some records reflecting the actual appearance of the new pathway. So mm-hmm. based on what you can find here, it looks like that was probably about six hours before, before the jar showed up. Um, and... You know, basically, uh, it seems like it was pretty sudden. Like, you basically went from absolutely nothing to, you know, a singular kind of, like, flare up on the sun. Nothing that would be totally unknown normally, but still certainly, you know, big enough and visible enough to be notable. That was followed shortly thereafter, maybe within, like, ten minutes or something, by this new arc of plasma suddenly just shooting out. Um, You know, they were able to identify that the satellites got taken out pretty quickly, you know, after this happened. Um, and there was definitely some, uh, discussion about like what they should do, who they should report this back to, what they should do to investigate. Um, but you know, not a lot more information than you guys have access to otherwise. Who did they report it to? Uh, basically back up to their bosses, nobody else. So this, this company would have been made aware of this. Hmm. Troubling. Um, this is, it may not be time to answer this question, but I certainly am curious as to how interstellar communication works in this setting. Because mm-hmm. um, we're, we're, we're talking about messages traveling out of system, right? And yep. uh, presumably they're not just zipping through the void of space at light speed. So, Yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> Possibly quantum entangling. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, they travel the bones somehow themselves. Um, yeah. I think we should prioritize following the new pathway because if the Jark left here to go there, mm-hmm. we want to we want to find out. We don't want to be any further behind them than we already are. One hundred percent agreed. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna time to go. I'm just gonna do while we're prepping to leave a quick like check in with any of the other colonies or stations in the system. Like I'm just going to call them and see if anyone yeah. answers. Hey, Sidra also, mm-hmm. do you want to see uh, if there's any sort of financial communication between the company that owns this place and excess? Uh, did we already say that did we, we didn't do that? find anything? Yeah. There's, there's no financial okay, sorry. connection there. Damn it. Okay. So, um, you know, you can, you can kind of call around, um, you know, there's a, there's a few other, you know, mostly skeleton crew type mining operations in the area. Uh, most of the people at these were starting to get a little panicked that they hadn't heard anything back from this facility, which would have been the biggest, you know, kind of hub in the system. Um, you know, you, you get to have the same kind of conversation several times where somebody is 
really happy to hear something at first and then really deeply unhappy to realize that it's somebody else who's come in and is reporting back that everybody in that facility got killed by mercenaries. Um, so, I'm not sure that I'm telling them that necessarily. Well, I mean, you're some weirdo, so like they're not. It's either that or they're like panicking <laughs> for unspecified reasons. So take it yeah. back, I guess. I'm I'm um, probably actually telling them that I'm a treasury agent checking in on local uh, disruptions. Oh, that definitely sounds less less ominous. Sure, let's go with that. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, nobody else seems to have been hit at all. Nobody else interacted with anybody coming through the system recently, so it seems to have been localized here. Mm. Maybe there is something here that specifically that they were looking for to take away or destroy. I don't think that's a bad intuition. Yeah, this seems like like it may be a destroy the evidence kind of operation. Is there anything hmm. particularly destroyed? All the things that are destroyed, destroyed. Most destroyed. Yeah. yeah. Are there head <laughs> offices somewhere? Yeah, there, there's a head office. Everybody there's dead, same as everything else. But um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, basically the the goal here was mostly to, you know, at least reduce the effectiveness of the communication systems. Um, you know, wipe out any visual or physical evidence that was really specific to what's happened here. Um, and uh, you know, it seems like generally to kind of make the the place you know, in operational, um, in a relatively efficient fashion. And based on what you can kind of identify was taken, it seems opportunistic. Like it seems like the sort of stuff that you'd get if somebody came through and they're like, okay, well I'm here. Nobody can stop me. Like what is the most efficient stuff that I can steal just because I like stealing? Hmm. Okay. So I think if we, if we want to piece together Anything more specific about the agenda and, and why they came here and not to the other ones, uh, not to the other uh, mining sites? We're probably going to have to catch up with them. Mm. Get it from the horse's mouth. Mm. Yeah, or the werewolf's mouth or whatever particular monster they're. I mean, it could right. be a yeah. horse for all we know. Sure. I mean, we haven't encountered any horse people yet. All right, we jump on the ship. Okay. Um, so you hop on the line. Uh, much like I said with the appearance, the actual process of riding it does not really seem any particularly stranger than normal. It very much feels like just a normal part of the network. Um, you know, so you hop on, you you travel through. Um, it's a little weird jumping to a place that you don't know anything about, but, um, you know, here you are. So when you're finished, it dumps you out. And so, again, you kind of get the static picture of what's going on here. Um, so the place it, it drops you out to is, um, the first thing you notice is that it's this kind of uh, strange trinary star system. The plasma actually hooks into the smallest of the three, which is a little white dwarf star. So it's this, this big red you know, plasma beam that comes into a star that's not that much bigger than it. So it's kind of unusual looking in that sense. Mm. Um, and then there's also uh, kind of a yellow star similar to you know soul and kind of size and and appearance and then a big brown giant uh that all you know are all kind of within close proximity to each other so that's something that you've no you've never seen before but it's unusual it's not like a super normal like stellar setup um and kind of scanning around after a minute, um, it becomes clear that there's actually only one singular planet that appears to be in this system. Um, and just kind of looking it over, it seems like it probably has this weird perturbated uh, orbit just as a result of this weird stellar configuration that it's part of. Um, so it's stable, but it, it kind of moves in this weird way that I don't know enough about interstellar physics to map out perfectly. But, but would you say that this planet is... Far, far enough from the the suns, but not too far away to to support life. Yeah, it's definitely. Would, it, you, would you say that this is in the Goldilocks zone? <laughs> yes, yes, I would say it's in the Goldilocks zone. Yes, and that one of these stars is too small, <laughs> and one of them is too. Oh, <laughs> oh man! Yes, I would say long walk, that. or rather, I would make you say all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, this one planet seems to be the only one in the area. So are you are you guys going to investigate closer to that, or 
I think that's the that's the place yeah. to go, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, leading with whatever scans we can scan. Right. So, um, you know, you you as you approach closer, the planet is probably about twice the size of Earth, all told. Um, as you get closer, you can see it, it's definitely like a rock type planet, um, and you know. Looking at it from above, it seems to be almost entirely like desert in quality. You know, you see different different types of kind of stone and, and sand and everything, kind of these weird color swirls on it, kind of the way that you would get if you like made a planet out of like one of those, you know, those like fancy toy sands that you can get where you make like yeah. a, you know, you put it between glass and you get the different, so it's kind of like a planet of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm which kind of follows based on how much kind of direct sunlight and everything you'd expect it to get. It doesn't seem like something that would have supported like a ton of plant life or anything like that. You know, so that's the surface of the planet. But you also see that there's this, um, in in kind of uh, static orbit around it, there's actually a network of satellites that are, um, they all seem to be active, like uh, electronically enabled and everything. Um, that actually seem to support kind of an energy netting, like a, a force shield that surrounds the entirety of the planet. So there's a lot of these that are kind of smaller, that are kind of spread out in kind of this netting around the entirety of the of the planet. And then a few kind of medium-sized ones that seem like they're kind of local control nodes or something. And then at one point in an orbit, basically over kind of the, uh, what you would guess is kind of the, I guess equator isn't really right because of the way that it interacts with the sun, but the point at the like the the point at the plane of rotation i guess Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. there's one much larger facility that kind of has one um you know kind of large pointy bit hanging downwards and then kind of four wings that that float off of it and it's kind of seems like it's it it's the central control spot of this satellite network basically and it's pretty big um, and as you approach closer, you're pretty quickly able to identify that the vessel that you're looking for is in fact docked with it. So, hmm. sorry. So did, did it look like this central control was actually tethered physically to the planet or is it just orbiting? It's just orbiting. Hmm. So the dark is from our area of space generally, mm-hmm. um, and thus it is wired for MoteNet, which yeah. is the the electronic system by which all the commerce in our sector of the galaxy functions. So I'm going to uh check it out. Okay. Give me give me a roll. And so when you say check it out, what what information are you hoping to gather here? I'm just sort of I think I'm going to use it as a backdoor um just to sort of get into their computer systems, maybe uh, Molly and I will work together on this okay. to sure. uh, see like what systems we can get into and figure out what the hell is going on, um, like recent communications, um, that kind of thing. Okay. So I got three. I don't know if my scale factors in in here i also got three but i do have um electronics as a specialty does that get me an extra one so four um okay so this ship is um is not in any kind of like high stealth mode or anything so it has some of its uh, kind of external facing communications um open um and it's broadcast recently uh what you're able to pretty quickly determine is that you have um, some encrypted channels that you're able to kind of dig into a little bit. Um, and what you basically have is a what seems like a pretty standard status update reporting that they had arrived at the destination, that they'd, you know, kind of surveyed the area. Um, it se- certainly seems to suggest that they didn't know exactly what they were going to be finding here um, and that they did kind of a similar process to you where they got here they took in what was present they identified that this seemed to be like the most important or central part of this network and that they were moving in to take a look at it and then at some point during what seems like it's a very standard uh, status report sudden cut off and that's Mm. the last thing coming out of them that's like what half a day ago that would have been yeah like 
six to nine hours, probably. So since we're in the system anyway, can we go further back and see if they have a report addressing the attack on the uh, station? Or, yep. Um... yep. Reported out. Not a ton of detail, but, you know, basically reporting, like, mission completed as designated, you know, reporting back a list of some of the stuff that they took, timestamp, um indication about you know their process they're basically inventory of people present to to make it clear that they didn't leave anybody left alive so they definitely did it i mean there's yeah, yeah. there's <laughs> not a lot of uncertainty unless there. it's less more the did they do it and more the uh why did they do it there's like nothing making it extra clear about the motive from that particular communication so from from stuff that they've already broadcast out uh Nothing that makes it clear. Oh, yeah, this is this is the exact purpose that they were trying to achieve here. Okay. Well, we can try and board the ship. We can try and do what they did, which is uh, gain access to this node thing, or we can try and go down to the planet. Well, the energy barrier is in our way, right? We can't just go down to the planet. Oh, okay. Th- that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So either way, we have to interact with with this network if we want to get closer to the planet than we are. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd I'd like to see if we can't at at some point in in our uh, in our operations here detach their ship from the uh, from the node here so that they can't get back on it and blow us up if they're still around. Yeah, I think detaching their ship is a good idea. Basically, I think um, if we can dock with their ship rather than with the. Uh, with the, the base itself, clear their ship, right? See if there's any physical evidence about why they why they might have, you know, cut off communications. Just, you know, inspect that first, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. uh, we can commandeer it and either detach it separately and then reattach ourselves to the, the base. Or we, we can go from there, but I think the first thing to do is to clear their ship. Mm-hmm. Cool. And we might want to see if there's any way we can make contact with the station without directly docking with anything just to see if Mm -hmm. there's a military or security if there's something that interacted the ss or the (laughs) The ss the excess um that has rendered them say dead Mm mm-hmm well i mean it's interesting too because this is obviously a very high-tech planet or civilization, mm-hmm. and it's not associated with the rest of the galaxy. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that in of itself is deeply question mark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're kind of trying to scan uh, communications for for the the location the the, the station satellite. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. You can kind of probe at it a little bit. It doesn't seem to be. It doesn't seem to have anything that's like accepting. There's nothing that seems to acknowledge it when you, if you try to ping out communications to it. But it does have one kind of outgoing um, communication, which just seems to be basically an audio recording alongside kind of a digital like underlying message. Um, the other recording is something that you can identify is probably kind of like a voice, but doesn't really sound like anything that, you know, any species that you're familiar with speaking and certainly not in any language you're familiar with. And um, then when you look at the digital underlying piece, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that what's going on here is basically that it's just reporting like an incrementing set of numbers. Um, and the numbers that it's doing are extremely, extremely large. So it'll basically just be like, you know, 10 quadrillion, 432 trillion, 987 million, and so on and so forth. And it just goes up by one each time. And then there's a digital representation of the number alongside the voice that seems to be saying the magic number. How quickly does it increment? Well, it waits about... A second or two after each number finishes, but it takes a long time to say each number right now because the numbers are pretty bad. Gotcha. You know, so it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's um, it doesn't seem like it's keeping a beat. It just seems like it's saying increasingly large. Numbers. 
Do we want to read the outro? Yeah, but Brayden, did you want to talk about your awesome book coming out? Oh, yeah. Um, so on in June, you can find Making Sense in bookstores. It's uh, art by me and my wife and art partner, Shelley. It's written by Arthur Yorinks. And it's about a boy whose parents are not expecting a kid, but they train bloodhounds, so they raise him as a bloodhound. It's very cute. It's sort of uh, 1950s style. And that's 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 the end of my plug. Is that is that spelled like... That's a pun, right? Like um, Make, Yep, making, making sense. sense with a C, S-C? S-C-E-N-T-S. Cool. Great. Yay. Okay, who's, got, who's still got the outro open? I've got it. That's it this week for The Chimera. You can reach us online at thechimera.space, on Twitter or Facebook at ChimeraPod, or by emailing itsthechimera at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on iTunes and Stitcher. New episodes appear periodically at some point. Probably bi-weekly. <laughs> I think we're leading bi-weekly. We'll see. All right. We're leading by. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Let's, let's, let's uh, go. Yay. 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 Yay.